currently collaborating with <clears throat> alumni from MIT's Julia Lab. And so they graduated and they have started this edtech AI focused startup called Visuara AI Labs. And we realized that we had similar interests. So we just started collaborating and I'm kind of doing my own thing, but it fits their bill. So it's like, great, you just do your thing and sort of we'll sort of ben like they get derived benefit from that. So they're focused on like creating educational content for scientific machine learning and help like make uh, people aware about the field, help them out with research projects. Um, and they want to uh, expand to like develop in-house research capabilities. So as part of that broader scientific machine learning initiative, I thought it would be a good idea to actually interview prominent scientists who are doing that sort of thing because it's a very broad field and it's very hard to define what that really means. So mm -hmm. I sort of just reach out to scientists who have done interesting work and it's an opportunity for me to learn from them and also to like create awareness so that more people know about the intersection of science or mainly physics and like machine learning. Mm -hmm. And you've yeah. done like really cool work in that space. And then you have your course, the the link you sent me last year, like machine learning and optics. So, and then yeah. I read your paper, like CNN's teach microscopes how to image and the physical mm -hmm. layers and stuff. Um, so that's why, and then my whole main research project just never went anywhere. Um, like it was sort of, I couldn't really follow my interests so with the startups with what the startup is doing, I can. And then I thought, wow, this is like a great opportunity to actually reach out and talk to you if possible. Because if my internal research goes nowhere, I can't reach out again saying, hey, I've done this and do you have any like opinions on this, right? So I thought, mm -hmm. well, this is lining up. Maybe I can reach out to you with this. Sure, yeah. Um. Okay. So first, I think I'll have to introduce you for the channel and then we'll get into the questions. So you're sure. uh, Professor Rurik Hostmeyer at Duke. You're an assistant professor at Duke in the biomedical engineering department. And mm -hmm. you're an optics genius uh, who did his PhD at Caltech within Chang Hwa Yang's group. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you did your MS from MIT's Media Lab. And you did your yep. BS at Duke your current university in physics and you minored in Japanese or something like that? Yeah, majored in Japanese, yeah. Oh, wow. So yeah. majored in physics and Japanese. Yeah. And That's you also great. run your own company, right? Ramona Optics. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a co-founder of Ramona Optics. I don't run it, um, but but I I help and, and, and work there uh, uh, sometimes a little bit. And you also teach this course on optics plus ML and do work with physical layers. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yep. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's like your introduction and this is just the second episode. So you're the second guest. And um, okay. I, I like to sort of keep the <laughs> talk and the introductions very informal. So I go to research seminars where they're reading off like he did his PhD here and his postdoc here. And I just don't like that because it's not organic. And it means that like the host isn't really passionate or invested in like the guest. They're not like, oh, this guest is cool. It's like, why do you have to read off a script? So I try and not have, so I do have some questions prepared, but I'll try and not look at it because it's more like I have things I want to ask you and it'll be great to learn from you. Sorry. Sure. So yeah. You're a physical scientist who got into machine learning and primarily you did optics, right? So yeah. I'd love to like know more about like your life and career journey. So where were you born? Where did you grow up? Why physics and Japanese? And how did you get married to optics and then cheat on it with machine learning? The whole story. And sure, get yeah. into startups and your experience at grad school and Duke. And yeah, I'd like to know like the whole story. Sure. Those are that's a lot of questions, um, but I'll try my best. So I, I, I grew up in the Bay Area in, in Palo Alto, California. I um, I was always interested in science and math. And so uh, I had some nice opportunities to work um, on some research projects when I was a, 
undergraduate here at Duke. Um, and I, I worked a bit on astronomy type stuff. I got really interested in how telescopes work. I worked a little bit on some neutrino detection type stuff. And I got interested in how that whole apparatus worked. Um, and so I kind of learned that I was interested in how devices were made to measure things, um, which led me to start working um, with a, a former professor here who's now at the University of Arizona, David Brady, who worked on, on cameras and really neat uh, imaging systems. And that kind of uh, spawned my interest in imaging and, and, and all of these interesting computational methods to process images. Um, and so that, you know, eventually led me into grad school on that topic. And then in grad school, I, I became interested in microscopes because they're, they're just a lot more fun to play with. There's a lot more you can do. You have full control over everything, that the illumination, how the sample is prepared, everything um, else you might need to get the data you want to see. Um, and so that was always uh, exciting to me, and I enjoyed um, that uh, aspect of it. And so I kind of focused more and more on microscopes as the years went along. And then in in graduate school as well, both in my master's degree, but then more so in the PhD degree, I got interested in machine learning methods. Um, at that time, neural networks was kind of like, um, you know, a bad word almost. They were something that had been attempted in the early 90s with a lot of fanfare and excitement and had completely fallen out of, out of favor, essentially. Not many people were working on them or studying them. This is in 2009 and 10. Um, and I, I just more from a mathematical perspective was interested in how machine learning worked, and the history behind it, and, and kind of all of the findings that led to the ability to create classifiers and stuff. And so I took a course at Caltech about that uh, by a professor named um, Yasser um stuff something like that i forget the, the full yeah he has it was famous, excellent yeah youtube yeah yeah he's quite famous but he had a really wonderful course on it and that you know kindled my interest in that and so that was you know i don't know 2013 or something kind of right when everything was just exploding with convolutional neural networks um and so i was kind of observing this you know very rapid increase in the interest of um, neural networks once again over a few years and um, eventually yeah just um, really wanted to jump in and give it a shot and start start um, using those myself and so I just kind of found a way to use them mostly to learn um, how all of this great auto differentiation software works um, this was, yeah, also really early on when it didn't work very well and it was quite challenging to use. Um, but, but that, uh, through that experience, I've, I've kept with it and, and now the field is, you know, much too large to fully understand, but, but, um, I, I really enjoy continuing to learn about it when I can. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned like a lot of interesting points. So if I were to summarize it in a few sentences like as far as what I understood so in your during your basic physics degree you did a few projects and you got inter interested in scientific instrumentation and with microscopes that's like sort of one area where you have control over the entire pipeline so you know like your parameter space even within with the instrumentation and then you also like the algorithms you got interested in neural networks, but it was at a time where it was like, what are you doing? But you wanted to like get deep into it and then you just found ways of doing it and now you're just doing it. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And they're at the point where there's so many different aspects for how these deep machine learning methods work that it's it's really challenging to keep up and, and fully understand. Um how and why certain methods are are 
are making progress or outperforming or, or might be of interest or use. Um, and so now I, I more rely on graduate students in my lab and others, friends and colleagues to point me in the right direction, I think, for a lot of these more advanced methods. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I think it's going to continue to evolve and and grow and, and um, provide interesting and new and useful features that you know, I personally at least will adopt into the space of microscopy to help improve yeah, how those instruments work. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned like the fundamentals and even if the field evolves rapidly, I think it's growing in breadth, maybe not so much in depth, like in terms of like the fundamental like building blocks. And you said that you were interested in it. So that's actually, yeah, something I wanted to ask you. I was planning on asking that later on because it's sort of more technical but like the way I understand it is that so because I've also come from a physics background and you're trying to maybe find a function which describes something and you you're sort of looking for a function which can approximate anything so you need a universal function approximator and a new at least a real valued single layered uh, neural network uh is shown mathematically to do that. And then I always use the word observed universal approximation capabilities for multi-layer perceptrons or CNNs because for real value, there isn't a proof, right? So that's why we use it in physics is what I understand. But the thing is the fundamental unit is the neuron. And you sort of want to mimic biological intelligence. And in the 1960s, it was shown that complex valued neurons as opposed to real valued neurons are more functional. Recently, neuroscientists have shown that they can compute the XOR gate, which a real valued neuron can't. Optical computing supports complex valued neurons. And within optics and wave-based physics, you're, at least in quantum mechanics, your problem is intrinsically set up in a complex valued space. So if we use a real valued neural network, we are projecting it onto a subspace which is less functional. So why not use complex valued neural networks is a question I've been asking, but it's so deep in the weeds that um, it's sort of, I couldn't really get an answer from anyone. And even in terms of developing the software, like I think the scope to do it ab initio in Julia, as opposed to using something off the shelf like PyTorch, which I as a physicist, I prefer having control over the entire pipeline. So I'm like, why do I need to use JAX and PyTorch? Why can't I just write my own neural network? I can if it's not done and if it's useful. So since you're interested in like the fundamentals, you do optics where complex numbers are so important. Do you have any thought of neural representations using complex numbers? Yeah, um, a little bit. So yeah, I've experienced all of that firsthand. I guess when TensorFlow first came out, I was what like kind of a, I guess, probably a pretty early user. This is in maybe 2015, 16 timeframe. And it didn't support complex numbers, but I needed, I needed them because my inputs and outputs were complex valued um, or I was allowing those degrees of freedom. And so I had to code everything separately, all of the real and, and imaginary stuff and do some tricks to make sure the gradients were flowing and and complained a lot on forums <laughs> to the developers at Google um, to support complex numbers. And then, yeah, lo and behold, around, I forget which year, something like a couple of years later, took a while, but uh, 2017, 2018, maybe they, it started to support complex numbers. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that because for those who want to, have a uh, more physical insight into, you know, um, things that aren't just text or, or whatever, uh, pictures that are basic, um, of cats and dogs or handwritten digits. Um, uh, the complex value, you know, numbers are kind of the basis of a lot of physical, uh, work. And so, um, supporting that is really useful. Yeah, and then I guess as for how the weights themselves 
uh, the neural network itself, the neurons themselves could, whether or not having them be complex or real. Um, yeah, also is an interesting question. I think it can certainly probably just enhance flexibility and add more degrees of freedom. And uh, I'm sure folks have tried it and, and found different interesting things. I'm not, I'm not a total expert in that space. Um, but yeah, I guess in, in practice, when you're dealing with actual experimental data, trying to use neural networks to interpret or help assist with, you know, the kind of um, analysis of data, uh, the fact that neural networks provide a universal function isn't so important. Uh, what we struggle with a lot more is that, that um, the data you capture for training an algorithm, you know, really needs to be representative of future data you might collect. Um, things change in an experiment. So you capture data on one day versus another patient cohort A, and then you start to look at patient cohort B. And any little changes in that can really throw your own network right there there problem i see um that really we focus more of our attention on i think like you got cut off like the last few sentences so could you please repeat that i i understood that you were saying that it's more about curating the data very carefully it's about curating the data very carefully and um we spend a lot of time in, in, in my lab and our research dealing with that problem of data fidelity and mm -hmm. ensuring neural networks are robust to data that might change or that when you actually use the network might throw the neural network off a bit because it's slightly different for, for an unexplainable reason. Mm, that's a... Uh... Yeah, I think data is king for machine learning and having good data is, yeah, it's of paramount importance. And if you don't have that, it's really hard to get any sort of insight using an ML algorithm. So that's that's there. So with the complex numbers, was your was the use of complex numbers mostly to support the hardware and the fact that all the optics relies on it? Or was it more... It, an investigation into like the basic math of how you can have a complex value like latent space or yes, yeah, so was it more was it tailored more towards supporting the hardware because you're using optics or was it more into like algorithm math mathematical foundations? It was the hardware. It was it was if you want to accurately model how a microscope works. Um, on a bright field microscope, not a fluorescence microscope, then you need to account for complex value numbers um, because all objects, when you look at them under a microscope, they can absorb light, but they also can cause light to diffract and shift in phase. And that that diffraction, that shifting in phase, fundamentally requires complex values to describe it. Um, and so if you want to fully you know, even not even fully, if you even want to get close to accurately simulating how a microscope works, you need to work with complex values. And, and in those investigations we were doing, that was our central goal. And so we had to add them in. <clears throat> mm, so then, so what are your thoughts about exploring this on the algorithmic side, like actually building out a complex value latent space, not so that like it should support hardware and it should support other wave-based physics like quantum mechanics or or be like even maybe you have a lot of motion tracking problems where you have something moving through space and that's described using like quaternions which are hyper complex numbers so i'm thinking more of like a complex valued physics informed neural network but everything on the algorithm and math side where you have an open source package written up in julia or you have the con uh, theorems for like proving convergence and various architectures and things like that. And then tying it to like the neuroscience perspective of having an XOR gate being solved by a complex valued neuron. And then having it later tie into optical computing and like microscopy problems and maybe 
motion tracking problems where you care about hyper complex numbers. So what are your thoughts about that exploration? Um, yeah, I guess um, it's a trade-off. So, so I think, yeah, making weights, right, the network itself complex valued and opening up the, you know, whole infrastructure to support fully complex transforms uh, will, I'm sure, be more flexible and, and lead to new new abilities and discoveries. But it comes at the cost of, of computational complexity. Um, and so I just know that people are also pushing the other direction. They're saying um, all neural networks should just have binary weights, just ones and zeros. Oh. Right? And those have been shown to work quite well. And they have the added benefit of, of not being much more computationally efficient to compute in the sense that you no longer need to do multiplications, you just need to do additions. And so uh, when you have that a reduction in complexity, then the benefits of the GPU effectively go away. And so you're no longer constrained to having to buy the latest and greatest sense of NVIDIA GPU, which has a certain memory limitation. You can use CPUs and be efficient and take advantage of you know much larger memories. So I guess yeah, there's trade offs in this whole space. But I, I yeah I I think uh, exploring them all um, will is great. And I think tailoring your neural network architecture to your specific problem problem area is really the way to go. Right? You really want to find what works best and and push it and keep improving it. But what about the fact that the electron, like most of the back propagation is running on electronics and the electronics are not supporting complex valued arithmetic and the electronics don't seem to be good when with LLMs we need so much compute power. So what if, do you think we'll have to move to a paradigm where optical computing becomes king and if it does, then would we actually need this complex valued stuff even or if we go in that direction, then would this be less, would using inherently complex value latent spaces in neural networks be less of a bottleneck if we shift to an optical computing paradigm? And do you see that happening with LLMs and everything that's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. The whole optical computing thing, I think, is also very interesting. It's um, my first job after I was an undergrad, uh, I went to work at a a company that doing research um, where my my boss, his name is Ravi Athali, uh, did a PhD in optical computing in the 1970s. Um, and I obviously learned a lot about it from him, but it's been around a long time, right? And um, I think it's fascinating. I think it's made inroads in certain areas and has uh, been, you know, bested by electronic computing in many other areas. Uh, and it's really hard to try to develop a technology that uh, is attempting to scale uh, with Moore's law because you essentially have to to keep up with electronics, right? So um, there's a lot of challenges, uh, I think, in terms of competing with electronic computing, um, right? And also, you know, light, it's great for certain applications of sending information, right? It's very information rich when you do get it into a fiber, um, or it can be. Uh, but it it requires a lot of space. And um, someone, a former advisor of mine, said would say photons are really fat, uh -huh. right? They have to sit within a half micron area effectively electrons are much much skinnier right you can go down to angstroms so it's it's many orders of magnitude more space is required and so that's another challenge with with optical computing so yeah we'll see um but but i think i again i think uh, i see this in in a way that will become tailored for specific applications right so Machine learning is yeah going to pervade a lot of 
spaces uh, and and applications and certain applications are constrained in different ways and require you know um, maybe optical computing to assist whereas others don't at all and, and we'll be fine with you know the power of regular electron based computers for for years to come probably so things need to be like sort of tailored to the application so definitely well that's always the best right if you have that ability then you can always improve your your performance right compared to um what is kind of standard mm -hmm. So was like your course, the one you designed, like ML and optics, was this something which came out of like tailoring towards application, like tailoring, was it something like I want to tailor ML for optics, but in a broad sense and then develop the course? What was the like motivation behind developing that course and when were the seeds sown like in your head, like, oh, I'm going to do this course. What's the story? Yeah. That's a good question. I guess um, most, you know, professors starting off, at least here at Duke, I think at other universities as well, are usually given the chance to design a, a new course. Um, and so I was, and uh, I had, I was working on that topic of uh, using machine learning to kind of model imaging systems and optics and then optimizing certain aspects of uh, imaging systems and how optical platforms or measurement systems can work. And uh, I just had a lot of material and <laughs> it just was fortuitous, I guess. A, B, I also, it was a graduate student course and the graduate student courses I enjoyed the most when I was a student were ones where you could do a project that you could really kind of Dig, dig into and hopefully connect to some of your research that you're doing, you know, in a, in a lab. And I, I tried to make the course accommodate that. And I saw a lot of ways in which machine learning and the ability to design, co-design or co-optimize how images or certain properties of images are acquired or um, how they're analyzed could really help a lot of different groups uh, in general, um, especially here at Duke, where there's people working with all sorts of imaging instruments um, at the clinic with MRI and CT data, um, and then in laboratories, right, with, you know, electron microscopes or uh, optical microscopes or regular cameras or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. So what what are the challenges you faced when you were designing it and once you started delivering it, I'm sure you there would have been things popping up which you probably didn't think of or like you were maybe biased towards one thing and you found out that the opposite thing is true or stuff like that. So were there things, challenges popping up as you sort of went through with the course? Um, yeah, there's always challenges with every course I've learned, um, and it changes every year, even if it's a very similar course, right? The students and the timing and everything is different. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of the challenges we faced um, were, you know, allowing or encouraging the students to use the latest and greatest software tools um when they were rapidly under development and so keeping up with um you know the developments in these platforms like pytorch and tensorflow um allowing yeah. students to get access to a significant amount of compute power without a large cost um making sure they all understood how to deploy and 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 work with code at kind of a funny scale right where you're generally running in the cloud um, was also challenging. So um, we worked through a lot of that. It took some time, but um, but it's it continues to pop up as a challenge because, you know, software always changes. And if you want to keep up with the whatever's working the best, you have to change. Yeah, I think that sort of organically brings me to my next question or something that I've been thinking about. So I've, I was really interested, I am really interested in 
teaching a course i think we did discuss this in earlier emails for like physics and form machine learning or scientific machine learning and at that time i had started using pytorch but i picked up jax and uh, uh, i was told at my university that i don't hold a phd so i can't teach a full course because whatever politics so with the startup they are like yeah, we don't care if you're good enough you can teach so now i started developing these lectures and i think i sent you the link to the first one and um the people i'm collaborating with they're really biased toward julia partly because they're mit grads and <laughs> i don't need to tell you about that uh and i'd started learning jackson i thought it's a good tool so i had um like i had the second lecture where it was just focused on if you're a physics or an engineering student and you don't know much about writing code can we use some physics problems to introduce automatic differentiation automatic vectorization object oriented programming walk you through like just the basics starting from like slicing arrays in numpy to auto diff and auto like j bmap in jax and then the oops and then combine everything and sort of just have a, one comprehensive like lecture on that because then you sort of know why and how you're using these tools when you see like a problem from mechanics or very basic physics being solved using these things so i don't know if that's a good way to help students get used to like a platform like jax because they could be scared oh it's what is this jax thing and then you have suddenly have a neural network with loss functions and this and that and so much code with the physics models so i don't know if <coughs> that can be helpful so I, i did put out a lecture like that but i don't know if that's helpful any thoughts on that uh yeah i think you just have to try a lot of different things and figure out a sequence of how you want to introduce that material that works with people who are unfamiliar with it yeah i think there's lots of ways <clears throat> to instruct people especially in this space and it's in my experience pretty challenging to determine an optimal way without actually just kind of trying it and, and sharing what you have with other people because yeah sometimes something seems really complicated in <clears throat> tensor flow or or pipe jax or whatever it is and people actually can pick it up pretty quickly compared to some more simple what might seem like a somewhat simpler concept people can really struggle understanding it when when they're trying to implement it so yeah it's really uh you know something you just have to experiment with i think but i was going to ask do you know um uh Srinivas Taraga do you know him or no <clears throat> have you heard of chromatics no chromatics okay yeah so <clears throat> there's a researcher friend um he's at Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, called the place called Genelia Farm which you may not have heard of it's very biology focused it's this uh really you know research uh, institute with a capital R uh type place that that um studies all sorts of biology <clears throat> he 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 is really a big fan of jacks he also is interested in microscopes designing them and um he and his team including a couple students in my lab have been working on like an open source package in jacks called chromatics which supports like wave operations and propagating light and modeling different microscope elements and <clears throat> things like that. So yeah, you you might check that out. Um I think they're always looking for for folks to join the team and and help um help with the development. Uh they they host hackathons um in the past, I know. They've invited people to to Genelia to kind of work together for a few days or a week or whatever. So you might like that. That sounds a lot of fun. I and chromatics and genelia right yeah if you just email me whatever i'll i'll try to remember to respond i could send you links yeah i think that would be a lot of fun to check out sure. um, so what's maybe the one piece of advice you would give to someone building a course like this out of <laughs> the discussions we've had and your experiences in the past yeah um a course like where you're introducing machine learning for physics type 
yeah. modeling or Not physics and sports. Sports. <laughs> yeah physics sure. and engineering right absolutely yeah i think um what are some good pieces of advice <clears throat> it has to be a lab-based course where the lab component is learning how to program in whatever language you're choosing i think that's unavoidable uh, because a lot of the students won't come in with that experience um and in my experience teaching code is you know one piece of the puzzle it's less effective when you're lecturing about how to do code versus actively instructing and doing active learning where students are actually coding and then you're giving small problems and working together as a team to come up with, which is the lab um and then another piece of advice is yeah having templated coding exercises really helps because students tend to everyone tends to get stuck on you know kind of complexities of code that probably aren't so central to the learning process they just serve you know nuances of somehow a function is called or something that you kind of get annoyed with um or you know uh hopefully don't get too annoyed with, but maybe just are really puzzling with that isn't the best place to spend your time when you're trying to learn a new concept. And so filling those in, having that pre-populated with code, right, and then leaving the key parts that are the most informative for the topic at hand um, for students to fill in is, in my experience, a great way to <clears throat> teach those concepts. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. yeah, then make making a project based. It's really important, I think, uh, having it be connected to things that are meaningful and have it be not just just one course, but for one lecture, but kind of building on concepts to create something larger with more interconnected ideas is great. So that's another thing I think is very helpful. Yeah, there are a lot of like nuances like using certain functions and I think there was one thing where I had to like look at the memory locations once there's some weird thing and I didn't realize that would be the biggest problem. I was stuck on it and then once I overcame that when I was like creating this video lecture where I was, there were Jupiter cells and I was walking people through it, I realized that I should talk about that because it's like those nuances where people are going to get stuck and never know what's happening and then I take that nuance and like maybe use chat GPT to be like, can you give me a, like a super simple example where this can happen so that a 15 year old kid can understand and he'll do something, he'll make mistakes, I'll take it, tweak it and then have that mm -hmm. as an example. And that seemed to have worked because the lectures are on YouTube. So I'm not interacting with people but people sometimes watch it and then send me a message on like LinkedIn or like email me saying they liked it or they didn't understand this. So Having it yeah. more interactive, maybe in person, if there's a way to do that and then helping them actually do the coding is, is I think, yeah, important. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, I think like going back to your machine learning beginnings, you said you got into it when it was like relatively new and people were like skeptical about neural networks. So what was like the one like what was the turning point or what was that exact like thing where you're like, oh, what made you really like look into neural networks the very first time? Do you remember that? Um, I, I mean, I knew about basic neural networks for yeah, the concepts of them right, that go back to the 80s and in early 90s, at least when there was a lot of excitement about them. Um, I just knew about them in general from probably different courses or just my own reading um, for, for, for a while, much before, let's say, 2014, 15 timeframe. <clears throat> and then I took that machine learning course, which again, wasn't about convolutional neural networks. It was just about neural networks um, at Caltech. And so what really changed was, yeah, the convolutional neural network. Um, that That's that's what, what really, I guess, um, piqued my interest from simply learning about the material to using it and applying it because it worked. Uh, worked really well. 
Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that the, the convolutional neural network, you know, that simple five layer, you know, design that, um, that, uh, you know, was, I think the first paper about that was in 2012, <clears throat> took a couple of years to trickle out and have people using it. Um, but I, I just was kind of aware of it. And then I actually had a friend um, who was, who was at the media lab still at the time who was using, using them and just said, yeah, they work really great. Right. These are, these are significantly better than, than any other, you know, method that we've tried before that, that kind of tipped me over to say, okay, well now I really want to learn about how do you use these, right. How do you actually implement them with the software that's required to get them to be trained efficiently. Right. That's, and that software was similarly being rapidly developed by, luckily for free, by free for all of us, by uh, people like Google and Facebook. Um, it was just an opportune time to to kind of adopt that and, and get going. So you would say like early adoption, there's just curiosity and interest and that just organically led to you doing it. It wasn't in like an external aha moment. It was just like, just happened so well the aha moment for me was well let's i didn't want to just you know download images and classify them i'm <laughs> not excited about that the aha moment for me was yeah thinking about how you could you could just you know make certain properties of the image itself the imaging process itself right learnable weights and then jointly optimize those right so being able to design parts of the camera right um the color filters you're using over the pixels or the the way in which light is shined on the shown on the object um things like that um and so i i got really interested in that and was working on it for microscope images and then was introduced to a paper uh by um someone named ayan chakrabarty who had done uh, a very similar idea for designing color filters on a camera and I was just even more motivated after that. I said, wow, this actually works. Um, that's, this is great. Um, let's see how it works in a microscope and, and what we can learn from, from these methods there. And so it kind of was a, you know, a slow process, I guess, of, of seeing some exciting technology, uh, really wanting to try it and learn how to use it, having an idea of something new you could do with it, and then being motivated by seeing others who who, who kind of successfully took the same idea and pushed it forward. Um, and then, yeah, continuing that and then using that to teach other younger students, right, in my lab here at Duke, uh, to then have them have their own projects and their own ideas and their own directions of investigation um, was kind of a, the lifeline whatever trajectory of, of those um, events. So is was the idea of physical layers born out of all of this, like have sort of the, not just cats and dogs, but the imaging merge into like the ML pipeline? Like is that Exactly, cool? yes. Yep, that's exactly it. So you can kind of put them seamlessly together, right? When you're putting in images of cats and dogs already, classify them there's nothing preventing you from then modeling further upstream how were those images captured how did the light pass through the lens or reflect off those cats and dogs you can go ahead and model that in your in your neural network pipeline and, and optimize components of that so that after training you not only have a good way of classifying images of cats and dogs but also could potentially design a camera that can better classify cats and dogs right or design a way to illuminate the the world to to better classify different things. Um, so the examples we focused on were were really in the microscope and <clears throat> improving the design of microscopes to better classify diseases like malaria um, or even COVID nineteen um, things like that was were something that we've worked on in the past and now we're excited about. Yeah. And so is the so when. You have these physical layers. Is the actual computation optical at that point for those layers where it's the actual, is it like hybrid optoelectronic network or is it a network on the computer where you're modeling that with uh, optical weights, fixed weights for 
point spread functions or yeah is it purely wouldn't be purely optical right is it hybrid or is it on the computer it really depends but certain things we can get is a first part that was purely optical right and so that would have to do with how the pictures were captured uh, how the camera is designed. And then a second part is the digital part. So once the pictures are captured, a specific neural network would then classify mm -hmm. those. Yeah. So that's generally how we approach the problem. But yeah, now there's many ways to to slice and dice that particular problem. Yeah. Oh, and that's why I guess <laughs> I read through your course description, you say that we won't just be classifying cats and dogs and that's not the sort of project you should do. I think you make make that clear in the course yes. description. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, as a as um, an engineering course, I really try to um, focus on not just adopting tools, but knowing how the tools work and trying to, yeah, learn about the design space and the various criteria needed to meet certain objectives as an engineer and and pushing that critical thinking forward is important. So I think that's always a good goal in a, a course that you're you're designing as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I sort of like that. And that's sort of the advice I've heard, which I've adopted, that you sort of want to solve a problem from your domain and then use ML rather than doing this Coursera cat dog. <laughs> classification where you don't really feel like you learn much because you the math is really easy for like someone coming from physics or engineering and then if you know enough coding you can do it but you feel like you haven't really gotten the point so I guess for me like if I have to get the point I'll have to take a pure math course where I derive all the approximation theorems or solve a physics problem where it's like you actually have to solve the problem so I guess both those approaches I think are like great but do you have any tying into that? Do you have any advice for maybe physics and engineering students who want to break into machine learning and data science? And they're doing it maybe, maybe it's a, uh, it's curiosity driven, but it's also, there's also this thing of careers and having jobs where there's a lot of jobs in this space. So people might want to transition for those reasons. So it might be a multi-pronged, sort of thought process where they're like yeah I'm curious about this but there are jobs in this area and research opportunities so if someone's coming into machine learning and data science from that perspective but maybe they're physics or pure science or engineering and know a bit of coding what's your advice for them yeah good question I, I have to go in just a couple minutes or okay one more minute but um <clears throat> yeah I guess my advice would be to really try to learn the basics, right? <clears throat> really try to start kind of from early first steps to make sure you understand, you know, how everything works. Because <clears throat> you know, if you just learn whatever the latest and greatest tools are and you just adopt them, right? Those will change. They're changing all the time, very rapidly. And so, you know, it's hard to make progress in a meaningful way in your career if you just um, learn how to quickly learn how to use tools um, because you know they're going to change and you'll have to quickly learn how to use this ones and you won't be very good at using them uh, if you're just quickly learning everything as opposed to really <clears throat> trying to figure out kind of the basics and then any new tool that comes out in the future you'll be able to have a better understanding at least a little bit of how how it's operating and and be able to you know adopt them more effectively um and so yeah i would suggest that and and i would suggest yeah be uh, to to use them right for kind of to try to write your own methods i guess or, or you know don't just download code but try to kind of work towards being able to write your own very simple code because if you We'll get to that point, then you you can be the designer. You're in charge of everything, right? And you can change things and they might break, but you'll know how to fix them. And that's a real understanding, 
right? As opposed to just downloading something and trying it. Uh, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. You 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 won't necessarily know why or how. Um, and 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 you won't be able to tweak and change and alter things um, while maintaining that understanding. Yeah, I think that was like really nice advice and I'm sort sure. of, yeah, along that direction, I'm uh, planning on coding up like a complex value neural networks from scratch in Julia using this paper. But um, I guess like following up, I'll send you an email and I forgot the name of the team you spoke about. We should. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to send you there and me. Yeah. And uh, so we should sort of follow up with that. And uh, yeah, with that, I guess like thanks a lot. It was great talking to you. I learned a lot. Yeah. And I hope the people who watch this on YouTube will also learn a lot. And uh, great. yeah, we'll stay in touch and I'll follow up with email. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Have a yeah. good one. Yeah, you too. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.